If you did run a festival where someone did die. Yeah. All of a sudden we get a on the radio that, um, yeah. As soon as that happened, the police came, the ambos came. There was media attention. Little did I know Nelly, uh, the rapper, was performing that day. And two big guys pretty much grabbed my, both my arms and dragged me out of my own club. Everything was going so well. And then bang, I heard one siren and there was another siren. It was, it was pretty much a going away uh, party. Oh, where, where were they heading? Uh, just to a, like a local penitentiary. I'm guessing that story in itself, we ran nah. a fucking rave in a church. Yeah, we did. He's not going to heaven. I'm lucky the priest didn't see that one. But yeah. yeah, I had the rosary beads out that day. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the first episode ever of Danny Ranch. You might have seen me on TikTok or even the Daily Mail as a fast-talking businessman who also performs as a comedian, quoted by them, not me. So my first guest here is none other than King Street's own George. I'll let him say his own last name because I can't say it. We've known each other for over a decade, but I, yeah, which is very rude of myself, but I actually don't know how to say your last name, as he is well aware. Yeah, it's pretty funny every time I'm hearing you try and say my name when you introduce it to people, but... Yeah, I'm George Gregoriadis. And, there you uh, go. He's, that's how yeah, you say it. That's how you say it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so George and I have known each other for well over a decade. And we've worked together for well over a decade. A quick intro on George's background is his family and himself. They own a lot of clubs on King Street and have so for the past 10 years. So when it comes to King Street, there's no other family that's more well known than the Giri 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 Giriadis family. <laughs> so his uncle, his dad and himself have a long, long history that spans over decades on King Street. And there's not a promoter that hasn't received a Palmer from one of their family members. Um, we've all come down at one point and got tucked into a Palmer with you guys. Basically, George, I guess you worked on King Street, your family's worked on King Street for how long? Ah, oh, 20 years. Yeah, 20 years, yeah. yeah. So with that, I'm assuming you've seen the good side and the bad side of King Street, no doubt. Yeah. And I'd love to kind of like go into it. I know there was a story you told me the other day when mm -hmm. we were talking about King Street. If you're happy to sort of talk about that, yeah. I'd love you to kind of bring it up. But yeah. we we're talking about one of your venues and I guess the dark side of King Street that you see. Yeah, I mean, like, it's obviously changed a lot from what it was now, it is now. Um, back in the day, it was like, it was like a festival every every Saturday night, Friday, Saturday night, thousands of people. Uh, we used to have a really busy night uh, at one of our venues <laughs> <laughs> on a Friday um, where it attracted some, uh, let's just say, some great people, but some not so great people. Yeah. And uh, we used to do a lot of booths and, and all that sort of jazz and... So, like, there'd be many and many a time where we'd have these booths come in and they'd be partying, celebrating, spending thousands and thousands of dollars and then... What was the occasion, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, well, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty much a going away uh, party. Oh, where, where were they heading? Uh, just to, uh, like, a local penitentiary. Oh, OK. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah, they'd be they're going away uh, for, for a long time sometimes or... Yeah, so just those... Not so nice people would uh, have a party and then, yeah, just uh, celebrate people one last time before they get locked up, I guess. <laughs> I, was, I remember George telling me this literally like a week ago. And he was saying that he used to see the booth list and it would say going away party and then he'd see the people in the um, in the booth wrapped in gold yeah. and then he would see those same people with the paper the week after. Yeah, you'd pretty much just see him in the, in the like, on TV just getting locked up and you're like, I think he was at my club on Friday. I'm yeah. pretty sure I saw him. And I'd be like, yeah, no, that was him. I guess that's King Street, right, though? Yeah. Like, it's always been the same. And obviously now it's, pro it's not really like that at all, is nah, it? Nah, it's, it's, it's very tame now. So yeah. um, it has changed a lot. Like, the scan tech, there's all that sort of stuff that people are bits that can't get into clubs now. And the strip clubs aren't like they used to be where they were owned and, and mainly uh, operated by those sort of, un like, yeah. Those sort of people, so. I'll say it for you. Yeah, it's not, yeah. That back yeah. in the day, the security companies were owned by different groups um, that had control of those streets. And it was a profitable business yeah. and desirable. So I've mentioned it before in other stuff I've said, but they used to have wars, security wars. Yeah. And sometimes, unfortunately for us guys, we would get caught up in them. Correct. Um, George has too, but we're not going to go into no. that. Um, but yeah. it's, a, it's unfortunately, <laughs> it has happened. It's a sort of a byproduct of working Correct. in that industry. Yeah. And it's one that most people don't want to talk about, which yeah, is completely no. fair. But most people want to hear about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately for you guys, that's a story for a back room somewhere. Correct. <laughs> cool. So I guess another thing that we did on King Street, or just off King Street, is that we worked together on a festival where we closed down Burke Street and we literally ran a festival on Burke Street yeah. with Psytrance and it was an event called Enter the Void. Yeah. And George was sort of the guy who led this project. It was actually his concept and idea. He came to us and we, we bought the event and we did the promotion and sold the tickets, but George put it together and I, I think it's pretty interesting from two points. Like, one, how did you get that across the line? 
and B, what it sort of cost to do that? Yeah, look, it was it was a, just a like a dream that I had, and I was like, surely we can't do it. And then sort of delved into a little bit, and we had to pick one date that was sort of non-offensive to a lot of people, which is like New Year's Day, because everyone's out and about, and you can sort of play music and and do that stuff where no one will be home. Or so it, we just went through the council process, which took a long time and a lot of money. It was probably about eight to nine months of planning prior to the actual getting approval, which was like management. You had to have all your like your licenses, Popes. POE permits. What is a POE? You want to touch on that? POE permit is just like uh, make sure all the structures and all that stuff are safe, all the exits are safe, uh, there's enough exits, all the umbrellas are secured so they can't fall. The weights. Uh, the weights and all that. All the structures are secure and, and have written signed off by engineers pretty much. And for people who don't know, if you don't have a Pope, you don't have an event. So Correct. Pope is, is basically your keys to any event that you've ever been to, be it yeah. a free one, to a multi-day festival, must have a Pope. And the thing is with that is, the Pope, they come and sign it off on the day. So it's not like you can get it well in advance. You might have done something not right or not correct. They can just say, your event's not happening today. Um, yeah, and we've morning. seen it. Yeah, we've yeah. Seen it. And I know every time we did, I did stuff, that was always the most nerve-wracking. Even Correct. now I'm thinking about it, I'm yeah, fucking working out. Yeah. yeah, it's like you'd sit there and be like, fuck, I hope we did this. And yeah. obviously they're, they were definitely not... They never turned a blind eye to stuff, but you had the opportunity to fix things, but it was hours. It wasn't... Yeah. You didn't have days. No. Yeah. So you, you basically got one shot at it, and if you didn't, right. you'd fuck up for everybody. Yeah, that's right. So other than that, I know you organised it all, and we did the staging and whatnot. From my memory, it was about 120K. Yeah. Um, and what did that break down to? I'll leave that to you to sort of... Because you did organise majority yeah. of it. So um, it, it's, it's anywhere from staging to sound to... Um, like having St. John's on site to make sure that everything's safe. We needed them that day. We, <laughs> that's a, yeah, yeah, we did. Um, <laughs> to police presence, to just the whole infrastructure and setting up council permits, uh, engineers, um, Bob staff. bar staff, to just to every intricate part of a, an event that you could think Even of. Even water barriers, like, like down to the Water barriers. Yeah. So there was one year where we had that. Gargazulas drive through Burke Street. Burke yeah. Street. It was like what? It, it was, was like it was ten days before our event. Yeah. event, and we had everything set up, all the plans, all the everything like that. And then that pretty much the day after that happened, we had to get water barriers and uh, extra infrastructure, which cost us an extra like twenty or thirty grand. Thirty k, remember? Yeah. So we decided not to use the street because of it. Yeah. Um, because it was going to cost us thirty thousand dollars, and at that time like any New Year's festival when you sell them, you don't know what the tickets are going to look like until yeah. seven days prior. So we decided to move it into the church, which is a guess another story in itself. We ran wow. a fucking rave in a church. Yeah, we did. A bit sacrilegious. Yeah. Sorry, Jesus. I'm sure <laughs> as an orthodox... Hopefully you didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go do a couple of Hail Marys. <laughs> yeah, I had the rosary beads out that day. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so it just... You just don't know what... To, you know, the council obviously enforced that upon us, so we didn't go ahead with that one. But, yeah, it, it's just... Everything you can think of, we had to pay, and uh, whether it was generators, yeah, um, people to watch food, generators, food uh, security, so uh, free water, all that sort of stuff. Um, that was what pretty much came under the hundred, and we had to pay the church. And you've had experience, obviously, beforehand um, running festivals because you'd worked in Earth Corps. Yeah. I'm going to go into that. How that's how George knew how to do this because he'd worked previously with. A famous promoter called Spiro Burasine, yeah. um, for a festival called Earth Call. But I did want to talk about one thing, which is kind of funny to us. But before I do it, I'm going to explain. It's a bit of a trigger warning. In our industry, and George can back this with me, we see a lot of things regularly. And so we become, like police, we become immune to it. So one of the things we see a lot of is actually ODs. And on this event, it was hot. And it was 4,500 people there. And it was a side trance event. So no, with it's only, that... It's only 2,000. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck don't, off. don't tell the guy. Oh, sorry, don't, tell, don't tell the council. <laughs> two thousand people were there. <laughs> um, two thousand one thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight people were there, <laughs> and um, so with that came uh, a lot of issues and ODs and people passing out and whatnot. And so George had just gone through a situation which we're about to touch on next, which is pretty serious. Um, and he was wigging out, so he had to deal with the Pope in the morning. Uh, he was, I would say, it was probably the most high strung I'd ever seen George, and because of that. I couldn't help myself but to poke him. So I was basically going at him and there, I think at one point there were seven ambulances on the side of the street and George was wigging out. It looked like he was about to have a mental breakdown. And I actually said to George, I'm, I looked at him and I said, well, at least we didn't have to pay for any lighting. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where it's like everything was going so well. Mm, yeah. And it was like the day was great. We got signed off. Um, everyone was enjoying was themselves. Hot, super hot. And I was, and I literally remember myself, I, was, I cracked open my first beer and I was like, this is great. This is a great day. And then bang, I heard one siren and there was another siren. And now, like, we shouldn't joke, but they were dropping like flies that day. And yeah, then you came out with that little liner. And um, do you remember the one? I like not to laugh about ODs, but do you remember the one who came on the wheelchair and he was like lack, locked in like Hannibal yeah. Lecter? He was like, he was like possessed by a demon. I should have laughed. And I was, I was in like, the church. Too. <laughs> he was too. <laughs> But he was like, 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 like he looked, oh man, and they were wheeling him out. He was like chomping at the air, and we all just looked at each other like, what the yeah, fuck was, was that? Fine. I forgot he was in the church. He was in the church. He's not going to heaven. I'm lucky like, the priest didn't see that one. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So from that, I guess when we talk about your festival experience and um, obviously the ODs, that's we are having a laugh about it. But there's a serious side to it, and yeah. unfortunately for yourself, you did run a festival where someone did die. Yeah. And tell me if I'm right or wrong here, but you were the manager of that festival yes. and that event. Um, I'd love to sort of dip into it. I know it's a bit of a personal thing. Even as we sit here, George and I have actually never had this conversation. Yeah. I knew what happened. I asked if he was okay. We went through it, and you were pretty fucked up about it all. Yeah. Um, I'd love you to sort of maybe go through what actually happened on the day of yeah. this situation, and then maybe explain what actually happened on the on the day that it happened. Yeah, so, um, it, yeah, like I don't really, I haven't really talked about it much to a lot of people. Um, I actually got counselling after it for a long time um, because it did rattle me a fair bit, um, which I'm sure it's, it's a normal process. Totally. But, um, yeah, so what happened was it was a Sunday and it was a very hot day um, and we, everything was going really well. Um, and like I said, yeah, it was, it was all going really well. And then all of a sudden, we get a ray on the radio that, um, yeah, um, that someone passed away. They they didn't wake up in their tent. Um, and I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, is it your fault? Mm, like yeah. that's pretty much what uh, came. And I, me being so naive and all that, I was very. Um, yeah, it, it took it pretty hard, and it was like, was this my fault? Did I, did I, did I cause this? What could you have done? Yeah, and I guess, and it was full on because, as soon as that happened, the police came, the ambos came, um, the council were all there. There was media attention, um, and the cops were just because I was the the point of focus, like contact. It was all on me, so That's everyone saying, was. Yeah. I had to provide all my my books and all the emergency management plans, and. You sort of wonder, fuck, did I fuck, did I, did I not do everything correct? And then you wonder, like, am I going to get charged? What, what's the process? I've never done something like this. And and don't want it, right? Yeah. And, and I don't think we anyone expects when you run a festival for that to happen. No. It does happen and it happens it's probably a, a couple of times a year. Yeah. But no one actually goes in there planning or thinking correct. that's going to happen. So, um, yeah, I guess... I was interrogated for hours on end. I was emotional wreck. I was crying. My parents actually drove up that night because I was just a, a wreck. Um, but I'll never forget one of the guys that um, one of the head policemen came up to me and he saw how distraught I was and he was like, "Mate, if there was so the person that died in the um, the tent had a heart attack, mm -hmm. um, and they were like, we attended that." As soon as someone found out someone was like that, we attended that in three minutes. Now, if that happened at your home, an ambulance would be there in 30 to 35 minutes. So we've done everything possible, correct? The roads were clear to the campsite. Um, you did everything um, possible. And I guess even though you hear it at that time that you still did everything you could and I was cleared and everything was – I did everything by the book, you still – have that um, thought in the head that you didn't do enough. And I guess it was sort of my career path that I really thought I could do something like that. And um, I tempted to do, I actually got approached because I actually was, I don't want to sound like a dickhead, but I was actually very good at it. Yeah, you definitely were. Um, and that was a big project too. That's yeah. arguably one of the hardest Well, there was 10,000 10, 10, people at this Bushdorf for five days um, with people doing drugs, um, people drinking, 
Jumping um, fences. Jumping fences, doing all that and controlling it. And it was a, like first year, don't get me wrong, I didn't do that well, but the second year I nailed it. Mm. Uh, everything went so smooth apart from that thing. So after that, I actually got approached by um, Richie to do Babylon. So guys, Richie McNeil is uh, the owner of Hardware and, and uh, he's arguably the most successful promoter of all time in Melbourne. So he's a big deal. Maybe yeah. one day I'll get him on here, but um, you were approached by Richie? Yeah, to run Babylon and um, I sort of accepted it. I, was, I did accept it. And go, I was working on it for about three weeks, four weeks when I was just like, the PTSD sort of got to me a little bit and it was pretty fresh after it. So it wasn't like I didn't have much of a break. And I was still doing counselling. Um, so I sort of just pulled back and I was like, I don't think I can do this as a career path um, anymore, which is a bit sad, but it sort of led to me to where I am now. So I guess even though something like that did happen, um, it's made me who I am now, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's all, all these sort of these mishaps or experiences, good and bad, yeah. they kind of take us on a, a different career path. And from myself, George, I, I've worked with you before and you're, you're an awesome festival organiser yeah. and it's super sad to see you have to go through that. And I remember when you did go through that, how rattled you were, yeah. even though I made that joke and I feel <laughs> like a dog. I, I, just, I couldn't help myself because uh, I'm a rat. But there's, <laughs> I, I remember seeing how rattled you were and, I, and as a friend, I, I knew that how much it deeply affected you. Yeah. But I, I think you got cleared and everything was completely fine. Yeah. You did everything right. And, I guess everyone in our industry would try to support you as much as they possibly could no. during that period. And it was lucky. The, the thing that also helped is when they, we found out that they didn't die from drugs or anything. It was just, it would have happened anywhere, uh, anytime. It was just an unlucky heart attack. So, um, yeah, I guess that was a bit of a... I actually didn't know saving, that. Saving grace. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm sure we could go into the whole Earthcore thing because no doubt that's like one of the most notorious festivals it's yeah. ever and the promoter behind it arguably some of the craziest stories I have involved him and no doubt you <laughs> too, but let's keep that for another day. Yeah. I know that when you work in our industry, obviously in the entertainment industry, you're constantly meeting new people, you're constantly meeting people, be it good or bad, infamous or famous. Um, and I know you've had a little brush in, which is a bit of a funny story, a bit more lighthearted than what we just went <laughs> on before, where you met a famous person. And I'd love to sort of, I guess, lead you into this story because I think it's a fucking good one. Yeah. So tell us who you met, um, who was famous and then, where you met him and the experience that you had. Yeah, so uh, Michael owns a brand, brand alley in uh, the city and we were just there having a few drinks on a Friday night and little did I know Nelly, uh, the rapper, was performing that day because I used to just go there on a Friday, have a few drinks anyway. And Nelly was there and it was probably 10, 12 drinks later that night. Um, his staff room is like the same level as the green room and I was like, I've got to meet this guy. So me and another guy went out um, you and then make this guy. Imagine if you didn't even kick yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and um, we were obviously a bit intoxicated, and there was him, and there was probably another four or five big African Americans there. Um, Zeki's obviously security guards, yeah. yeah, and his entourage, and me being because he's only a small bloke. He's right? a little bit, yeah. He's, yeah, but he's stocky, big. Yeah, like, yeah. Because I saw him, I, I had backstage passes to Sydney Mind Music Bowl. Friend of mine was doing the merch. Yeah, and I tried to get on him yeah. but he was gone it just smelled like weed yeah. but I could see him from the side of stage and he, was, he didn't look no, very big like he's what, not big. five four maybe yeah something like that but he's like pretty built yeah um, so like me yeah 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 <laughs> yeah so a statue of Danny Grant yeah <laughs> um, and then so the yeah, record, I was, I'm 6'1 <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I was just like fuck it I'm gonna go speak to him and obviously after you have a few liquid courages in there and I went up to him and I was like mate I fucking love you Nelly you're the fucking best I used to finger chicks to your songs back in the day <laughs> and literally, <laughs> literally, I've never felt more. I had two big guys pretty much grab my, both my arms and drag me out of my own club. And I, yeah, I got kicked out of my own club who was saying that, yeah. <laughs> but I, I was too drunk and I didn't remember it too much, but yeah. As, a, as another famous white rapper once said, yeah, um, you've only got one shot, do not miss your chance to yeah. blow. And you, you did that. I blew it. And you blew it. <laughs> yeah, I blew it. <laughs> I definitely blew it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've obviously you guys have seen me talk about um, WP Shots. Uh, if you were following me on TikTok, you would have saw the story that was probably the first thing that went viral for me, where myself and my business partners started a shot that we bottled and sold to clubs and now it's worth millions and millions of dollars. George is actually my business partner in that. And he's the guy in that story that I talk about that we're working in the bottle shop. So during COVID, we were all fucked. Yeah. And George and I worked in this bottle shop near his house. 
Which now it's funny because we look back on it, right? It was it was actually really really fun. Like, Mate, it was amazing. Yeah, it was the most humbling experience ever. Getting paid twenty seven dollars and and just working for the man, I guess. And it was it was great. Yeah, I was like, I, even me, like I remember from knocking off work and I just crack a beer and just yeah. relax and like that's something that we don't get to do. And yeah. it was like, and we used to try heaps of probably we used to have that group uh, where we used to try different drinks and it was a fantastic time of the year. Yeah, it was fun. It was actually it was the weirdest thing, but I think that anyone that situation would never happen to anybody else, no. right? Where your whole everything you've built for the last 15 years collapses underneath yeah. you and you've got to go back and work in a bottle shop as, yeah. a, as a retail person um not only was it humbling but it was the reason why our product started right, right. take that part of our journey away and george and us working together for decades prior we never would have started wp shops nah. so i think that it's um it goes back to what like, i always sort of push on this but like even if there's a bad like don't look down look side to side because if you're going through bad you're going through good there's always a fucking there's always another opportunity next to us yeah. and we pivoted and now we both i know george still, still has vested interests yeah. in nightclubs but we're both now a full-time head down bum up in this business our alcohol company yeah. which is dominating correct and it's like it's sort of like it changes like a holiday and, and working in the nightclub and working in that environment um for 15 20 years it's it takes a toll on you and then so to have that change and now we're on the other side of uh the alcohol side it's it's been great and refreshing it's a new challenge for us i guess so um and i get to see you every day and yeah we and get hear and your the, rants the, yeah hear my rants in person <laughs> live it's 80 bucks an hour i have to me. pay that for it yeah. <laughs> it's will soon <laughs> so the other, like on that too like with the alcohol stuff um we also get to continue to be in our own community right we're constantly talking to promoters yeah. we're dealing with other guys so even though we've taken one step sidewards we're lucky enough that we're We've, we're not completely out. So we're still getting yeah. to have all these awesome experiences, probably with some of the less yeah. of the byproducts and stress and yeah. the issues like deaths and ODs. So and it's, it's weird. I think also people see us now as not competitive. Like people forget that I'm a nightclub owner and are happy to talk to me about other things because they just feel I'm part of the alcohol, like an alcohol rep. So it's, it's I've got a, a different relationship now and like you do with the owners and the promoters and it's just a whole different side of things that it's great to hear. I, I'd agree with that because I feel like I get along with everyone. Like, obviously, I used to have my ups and downs. Yeah. I was a promoter, right? There was competition. Now I don't. Like, it's just all ups oh, yeah. with you everybody. Were you were famous for writing a status here and there. I was a bit, I was the king of controversy. <laughs> yeah. I love the good promoter war. <laughs> but um, now I don't have that. And I th I've mended all those bridges. <laughs> and now that he's got, I, I love to hang out with him and just Correct. gossip and do what we're doing right now, right? Yeah. Talking shit and talking war stories. And that's the thing in our industry. These are these is five war stories we're talking about with George, but I could sit here for seven hours. Yeah. I'm trying to keep this short format, which is difficult, but we've got so many stories just back to back to back to back because the industry we work in is just, it's one of a kind. Nothing yeah. is like that. And, and the alcohol industry is not much different the way we're running it. Yeah. And I guess the thing that we've got, in, which is an advantage that everyone else doesn't have, is that we've got that 15, 20 years feet on the ground. We understand what people want to purchase, what they want to do. Yeah. And that's why I think we're going to continue to be dominant. Yeah, I agree completely with that, yeah. So even though you still work in the alcohol company, you still sneak off every now and then give promoters Palmers though, don't you? Yeah, yeah, still have the meetings with the Palmers, yeah, yeah. Do you think that's ever going to change? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely not. And if you didn't do this, what would you do? If you weren't working in nightclubs and alcohol and whatnot, what would you have done? Oh, well, funny story. We joke about it all the time. But Your dad's a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> I actually pretty much am a lawyer slash barrister. So your kid can walk up to security guards in Melbourne and yell... My dad's a lawyer. Out yeah. there. That's amazing, mate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't believe you did that for them. Well, yeah. I don't have the piece of paper, but I did two and a half years of it. <laughs> so it pretty much makes me a lawyer. 75%. Yeah, correct. Well, I don't know. Like, I, it's funny because I did uni for seven years and I still don't have a degree to my name. Um, so, and I just paid off my hex debt literally last week. So that's fantastic. That's great for you, mate. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, fuck the government. And God, uh, you used it. <laughs> but... If I wasn't doing that, and well, obviously I wasn't smart enough to be a, a diploma graduate, um, I probably would have just, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Or I don't think I could ever walk around um, in a suit and work for someone. It, it just wasn't me. So yeah. I would have, whether it be a bar or, or something, I would have had my own business. And people I'm guessing too. Yeah, because I'm a very people person. I get along with people. And I like to be in business with people I enjoy. So um it's sort of, yeah, I would have done something like that. I think that's one of those things with people in our industry and what makes it, I guess, why people are tapping in now to watch this is that every single person that we work with is a fucking humongous character. Yeah. And that's, we all attract one another and Correct. I guess that's what makes this whole industry so exciting, right? Yeah. Um, George, firstly, I'd like to thank you for being my first guest. Obviously, you're one of my great friends and you're one of my business partners and 
I hold you closely and dearly to my heart and, and I appreciate your time. No, um, and I would like to offer you a gift, which Fuck. I don't think you have any of these at your house, but what? I would love to offer you no. one of our products because WP Shots is actually my sponsor. Wow. You can pick between the original WP or Sourpuss. It's up to you which one you want. I'm a bit of a Sourpuss, so I'll okay. get that one. Yeah. There you go, mate. We, I, I, you don't have a factory full of them, so... Take that one home and you can now. This doesn't taste like Hubba Bubba, does it? It tastes exactly like Hubba Some what? people say Zubba, Zappo shots. No way. 100%. Fuck. If you don't believe me, you have to try it. So I don't know if you know this, George, but it's actually at First Choice Liquor um, and also Liquor Land around Australia. And you can buy it online and at all good independents. Did you know that? I had no idea. Well, there you go, mate. But thanks for coming down and get tucked into that. Oh, I probably delicious. will right now. Thank you. <laughs>